this seems to be on, so I can now take the floor and say good morning, everybody. Quite a pleasure to see so many of you, known faces in this room today, so real people. But I'm being told that we have nonetheless real people as well, but only online, and up to 600 people. So that, I think, shows the importance of this event we're having today. My name is Olivier Boutelis. I'm the Chief Executive of the Council Europe, and I'm delighted to host this event today uh, and talk about anti-money laundering, a topic on which Accountancy Europe and the Accountancy profession have been working quite a lot. And I still remember the first time I spoke at a European Commission conference on the profession's contribution to making anti-money anti laundering work. That was some um, 12 or 15 years ago, I don't remember exactly. And I think there was a real realization at that event of the real contribution that this profession makes to fighting money laundering, financial crime, and terrorist financing. And I'll tell you something, because uh, as it so happens, in a previous life, I've been a public prosecutor. So I know a little bit about crime. And I've seen a few criminals, and I'll tell you something, they're all in this for the money. That's the only thing. Well, not all. Let's say 99% are in crime for the money, and you've got 1% of psychopath and others that you know, are not even there for the money. So the best way, to my view, of fighting you know, crime is actually to prevent them from using the proceeds of crime. And that's why I believe we all want to live in a safe society. We all want to live without crime, wherever it is, in our financial systems, on our streets. And I think the best contribution we can make is not necessarily to study martial arts or you know, join the uh, rifle association. It is to take our full responsibility and fight money laundering. So on that note, I think this event today is highly topical because we're reaching the final stage of the new wave of legislation. I'm very grateful uh, to Angela, Angela Foyd, who uh, will be uh, chairing this event today. And we've got, I think, uh, a fantastic contributor uh, to our efforts in Accounts Europe uh, to fight money laundering. Angela? Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Olivier. Okay, now we move on to having a opening statement. I think we start with the European Commission. So if I can ask to take up, and I think there should be another one here. So I don't know whether you want to introduce yourself or whether you'd like me to introduce you. I'll do it while you're getting that switched on. So this is Ms. Chiara Baki who is the team leader of enforcement at, of EU AML, uh, anti-money laundering counter-terrorist financing policy at the European Commission. So very welcome, and we look forward to listening to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me today. And indeed, I'm the lucky person who was leading the team uh, who came up with this package, uh, proudly so, uh, I have to say. This has been an effort uh, on our side, and uh, we think... Uh, it was uh, extremely needed. Um, I have to explain uh, what this package aims to achieve, uh, and I would say that in the current context, uh, it feels a bit like I'm speaking of prehistory, given uh, all things that have happened uh, since uh, 2019, where actually uh, the package found its, uh, let's say, source. Um, and that's why I want to go back in time so much, um, because we are very much focused on, uh, on new ways uh, of tackling financial crimes. But uh, bottom line uh, of why we are in this at this moment uh, is uh, this set of reports uh, that we had issued back then, uh, which looked a bit at how well the EU was faring in terms of preventing and fighting money laundering, predicate offences and terrorist financing. And I'd say the picture was really gloomy. Um, we ha were having the scandals that were making the headlines uh, of the newspapers. Uh, we 
we're seeing uh, quite poor cooperation between competent authorities, uh, uh, or when we had good cooperation, we were lacking the instruments for that cooperation. So there was a sort of realization that uh, where we stood uh, in terms of preventive measures or protecting our economies uh, wasn't really quite aligned with what our economy looked like. So we have an internal market, a fully European dimension, when it comes to economic uh, interactions, and uh, we had uh, national rules um, which were built on a minimum harmonization directive. Uh, and what we hadn't realized until then uh, was that in between this, uh, we had uh, crime that was of a European scale and threats that were of a European scale. So that was the starting point, the big realization moment in a way. And what the Commission set out to do in 2020 in its action plan uh, was to sort of level up things. So we have uh, an EU context in terms of risks, and we have to put the mitigating measures there. That's how we call them. So what was this package intending to do? Um, well, many things, um, but mainly with regard to the, um, to the measures uh, to fix the two main dimensions, so the regulatory dimension and the institutional dimension. On the regulatory side, uh, I have already touched a bit on what we had seen, so a lot of fragmentation, uh, rules that were not necessarily adequate to deal with cross-border situations, uh, um, rules that were often even not strong enough to deal with the risks. So we had to find a way that we could uh, apply that logic that we put out in the package, basically same business, same risks, same rules. And those rules have to be strong. They cannot just be a minimum common denominator. Um, that's also because uh, in all this, uh, we have to make sure that whatever we have as measures do not become unintended barriers uh, to legitimate business operating across the internal market. I mean, the Commission, we cherish very much the internal market. It's, we think, one of the biggest achievements of the EU, and uh, we need to preserve it, preserve it from criminals, but also prevent, preserve it from any barrier that could inadvertently be put up uh, for businesses. So that was the goal of the, on the regulatory side, uh, and the goal on the institutional side uh, was to fix those, uh, those problems that we had identified. So, of course, they were of a different nature. I'd start with the easy one, the financial intelligence units. We didn't have problems of cooperation there. We know that the financial intelligence units cooperate and want to cooperate. What we were missing there was uh, some form of support and coordination of their activities. We needed to give them the tools to work together. On the supervisory side, the landscape was a bit more complicated. First, because uh, you have significant differences, whether you are in the financial sector as opposed to the non-financial sector. We had the European Banking Authority doing some tasks of coordination as uh, in the financial sector. Um, we had we have, still today, absolutely nothing in the non-financial sector. And that is an area that is not maybe as equally exposed, but significantly <coughs> exposed. And we're, we need to make sure that also at European level we do have clear rules and a, and a consistent system of supervision. Um, and what we also saw was the big difficulties in supervising groups for example, that operate across borders and in having consistent approaches to this supervision when we are facing uh, cross-border situations. So, so the role of this new AML authority in the supervision area is not to replace the national supervisors. We never thought or believed that we could come with a European solution and that will be the holy grail and the solution to all the evils. Of course not. But what we need is to have an actor at EU level that can be the center of a system that can give the impetus to that system, that can give the support to that system uh, 
so that actually then the national supervisors can work together, can work with the European supervisor, and we can deliver a system of supervision that is more consistent and stronger. So I'm not going to go into the details uh, of, uh, of the proposal because uh, I was allotted 10 minutes and I don't want to overdo my time. Um, uh, just to say indeed a bit what the, um, what the regulation aimed to do was to deliver this harmonization for the private sector, um, but not only that. In the meantime, there have been a number of, uh, of developments also at the international level, new standards adopted by the Financial Action Task Force, uh, mainly in the area of virtual assets uh, or crypto assets, as we call them in Europe. So one of the measures was, for example, to make sure that we do fully integrate uh, via crypto, sorry, asset service providers in the ML framework and we ensure traceability of those uh, uh, transfers. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we were up to date uh, with the latest challenges. So for example, you will see a few additional sectors that have been integrated um, in the scope of the regulation. We spoke a lot since the scandals uh, of money laundering risks, uh, but uh, we should not forget terrorist financing risks. Uh, and for us, one of the key new actor that should be covered is the crowdfunding sector, just uh, because uh, terrorist financiers are also capable of keeping up with innovation. So we should never forget that either. And that's why we decided to go down that path. Uh, and uh, another measure that has been quite covered uh, uh, in the press, especially in some member states, but which we think is really basic and very much needed in order to mitigate risks uh, is the capping uh, of large cash payments. Uh, uh, many member states have it. Uh, uh, some don't. We think what we put out, 10,000 euro threshold, is absolutely uh, needed uh, and also extremely proportionate uh, when one compares with the average payment in cash in the euro area, which I think sits around 25 euro. So that's what we're talking about. Um, I'm not going to go into the directive because uh, we will be having the uh, rapporteur from Parliament uh, dealing with that. Uh, so on, uh, on the AML authority, as I said, uh, uh, we wanted to set out two arms, uh, one arm that would support the work of financial intelligence units uh, and one arm that would actually be this, uh, hub, the center of this hub and spoke uh, system for uh, uh, supervision with powers also uh, in the regulatory area covering all sectors uh, so that at last uh, we do have some decent guidance also for the non-financial sector. We don't leave them to, to the mercy of the national supervisors uh, or uh, of their collective bodies uh, when they are able to provide some guidance. Uh, so some also recognition of duty on the European uh, level uh, regarding uh, those sectors. Uh, and of course, uh, um, like I said, uh, this last mm, measure that was intended to to make sure that we have full traceability of uh, uh, crypto asset transfers. Uh, um, what to expect now? Uh, well, part of the package uh, has actually already been concluded. Um, the traceability of crypto assets has been taken out of the package uh, and has proceeded together with the uh, MICA regulation, so the regulation setting up the market in crypto assets in the union. So we also front-loaded some amendments to uh, the AML framework in that context. Uh, when uh, MICA, TFR, as we call them, enter into force and into application, the, the AML directive will also see member states transposing uh, measures that make crypto asset service providers fully obliged entities. So in, a, let's say, two years, more or less, we should have a full framework covering crypto asset service providers uh, in the union. Um, with regard to the other acts, uh, the French presidency has achieved a general approach uh, on almost the totality of the AMLA uh, regulations, so the regulation setting up the authority. Um, and on the side of the parliament, uh, we are expecting uh, a negotiating mandate uh, in the beginning of 2023. With regard to the substantive rules, uh, um, the Czech presidency has uh, declared its intention to reach a general approach on those ones as well by the end of the year, so when their presidency, fi presidency sorry, finishes. Uh, and for the parliament, uh, we are talking of more or less the same 
time frame, so between end of this year and the first quarter of 2023. From there on, uh, it will be the fascinating world of trilogues uh, and uh, also taking into account uh, the elections of the European Parliament uh, in 2024, we are looking at uh, a possible end date, uh, an agreement uh, around September of 2023. So, um, Maybe it's not as fast as we initially had wanted to, but there is also recognition that this is a massive package. It will really change significantly the look of the AML framework in the Union. So we haven't lost time. Uh, it's just that it takes some time to come to a final uh, uh, setup for this new framework. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and actually, indeed, yes, it is a massive framework. I don't think that Mr. Niedermeyer is here yet. Um, so I think that what we might do is start with the Q&A uh, session of this, so the panel discussion. And then um, as and when Mr. Niedermeyer arrives, then we will. Um, Oh, he's apparently arriving in four minutes. Well, we can either entertain ourselves for four minutes or we can put a couple of questions to the panel, I think might be it. And then when Mr. Niedermeyer arrives, we can um, come. So first of all, I'll introduce the panel. Um, so you've already met um, Chiara Baki from the um, commission. It's also my pleasure. I'm going, as I can see them, from left to right. So this may not be in the order that they're written down in. So um, I don't know if you would like to stand up just to so introduce yourself for a moment. Mr. Chris Meskins, who is the Secretary General of the Belgian FIU, um, CTIF CFI, which I believe is an independent administrative authority, but I'll let you introduce yourself for a moment. Belgian FIU is an independent administrative authority and I've been working there since 97. And for the moment, I'm also chairing uh, the FIU net group, advisory group. That's actually the interface that we use in Europe uh, between uh, FIUs. And so I, I, I closely cooperate with Chiara on, on that matter. Um, so that's me. Silvana Capello, who I is to pronounce. I'm sorry, Pan <laughs> Silvina Capello. Sorry, I was trying to look at it at the same time. So I'll let you pass it's over. Okay, thank you very much. I am Silvina Capello, and I'm here uh, on behalf of the GNFBPs, the Designated Non-Financial Business and Profession. I work as an external advisor for the General Council of Notaries in in Spain. And now I think we have Gert Delru. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to Rue. I'm uh, still an active police officer with 20 years of experience in fighting money laundering and financing of terrorism. Uh, although I'm here as an, uh, uh, I'm an active police officer, I do speak here in my own name, but uh, I can say I can bring another view. I'm a little bit uh, a strange man. You are all in the preventive track. Me, I'm just the only one in the repressive track, but I've seen some discussions already, and I think uh, I have another view on what uh, you have to say, and maybe that can be interesting. And then, Mikael Lena. Yes, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, I'm Mikael Lena from uh, representing the European Banking Federation here. I, I work... Um, as a senior advise, advisor at at, uh, uh, at Finance Finland, which is the the Finnish trade body for for the financial sector, and this uh, money laundering uh, reform, the the this package is is obviously a very important matter for for the financial services industry, and uh, and we are looking very much forward to this panel, and and very much thank you for having me here. Thank you. Um, now, I think possibly if people just stay here for a minute with or have ha have microphones, because I think we're going to just ask one question, um, f one general question. Did you want to? Yeah, if you wouldn't. Perfect. So, because I think we're, as we are expecting the MEP. Um, so the first question that I'd like to ask, and I'm going to direct it first, I'm afraid, to you, Mika. <laughs> Sorry, I know you've just sat down, which was what it's, it's sort of a bit of a two way, which is what do you think 
the most important challenges that will be met by this package of measures are, and also what do you think, if we have time, to actually um, be the areas which will be the most challenge for the obliged entities, including banks, to implement? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, as, uh, as Chiara mentioned, the, the main problem, the main challenge, I think, it's the, the fragmentation of, um, of both the, the regulatory framework and the supervisory framework, and, and we are hoping very much to have, have improvements there. Uh, as regards uh, what would be the most challenging parts for the industry, it's still a bit early to say because uh, there are some, uh, some issues that are being very in intensely debated at the, at, the, at the Parliament and also, I think, uh, by the Council, and uh, we, we, it remains to be seen. But it's, it's like uh, what we would like to see is that the, there is a clear, uh, like, uh, like the risk-based approach is, is extremely important for the institutions, and we would like to see that, that it's, it's sort of uh, the, the boundaries or the areas where the institutions are able to, to apply a risk-based approach would be sort of clearly, uh, clearly shown in, in the regulation and also they would be uh, uh, given the opportunity to actually apply the, the risk-based approach because in, in, the, in the current situation, the, the framework which is directed based there are so many national differences uh, and there is also the national gold plating and, and these, these things that, that severely limit the, the possibility for, for making risk-based judgments. And, and when it comes to then, uh, at the same time as the you know, institutions are being blamed for, for not doing enough, they are being blamed for applying practices like, uh, which, which amount to, to re-risking or over-compliance and, and meaning that certain customers customer groups are being denied the services so it's very important that that the 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 the, the rules would be clear but we we are not worried so much about the number of articles in in the new package what we are looking forward very much would be that uh, that we are having uh, uh, rules that are simple uh, that are clear and uh, and also that that uh, sort of apply equally across across the 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 uh, uh, obliged entities uh, the the requirements do not need to be identical for all all um, all all parties but uh, but let's say that uh, because this is a horizontal is issue and and the banks can do only so much for this this to, to prevent money laundering and uh, address financing and, and financial crime in general. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think there's a couple of really important points that were raised there. I think firstly around the risk-based approach. And secondly, I think you mentioned about some of the over-compliance. And I just would like to bring Sylvina in here for a moment, which is um, when we look at some of this, and um, I think that one should hopefully work. But um, when we look at some of these and, and, and taking the risk-based approach, because there's always this dichotomy in some of the, the regulations between being quite prescriptive, you know, which almost encourages a tick the box, and what everybody talks about, about being uh, you know, sort of risk-based. You know, taking that into account, do you think that the actual package is designed well now to actually allow a successful risk-based approach and actually have, start having an impact on um, economic crime? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think that is a, a challenging question, um, especially for the DNFBBs. Uh, in the case of the DNFBBs, I fully agree with, with Mika that one of the main challenges is the application of the risk-based approach. Uh, and considering the sector, there are so many differences between the services or the products that they offer that uh, um, applying um, a common uh, risk-based approach for all the GNFBP sector is almost impossible. So I think the new regulation is uh, good for giving guidances or for setting clear standards on what to do, but still the sector has to do great efforts uh, to um, identify which of the services or the products they offer in the GF DNFBP sector um, are risky and which are the exposure uh, that they have. 
Remember that uh, within the, this GNFPP sector, we have uh, also legal professionals, which is a different part of the, of the GNFPP, it's quite different than, uh, from the others. And in that case, I think the involvement of the self-regulatory bodies is essential for this sector to implement a common uh, risk-based approach in the, in the countries. Also, I think that the, the regulation gives much more clarity and uniformity for the, for the sector because if you have paid attention to the, uh, how the countries have implemented this uh, uh, at the European level, uh, you may see that there are so many differences that this uh, uniformity is very welcomed by the, by the sector. And in addition to this, I think the second challenge is still the verification of the beneficial owner. Um, I think the registries, uh, and we can discuss, I think, this a little further uh, in, the, in the panel, but I think the, these are good or um, it could be efficient tools uh, if we ensure, if member countries can ensure that the information that is kept there is accurate, is adequate and is up to date, which is one of the weaknesses that we are seeing in most of the registries uh, right now. Well, Brilliant. You. Thank you, Alan, and, and a really good point about the registries, and I think also having consistency of access across the union would be a huge benefit as well. Um, not just consistency, but ease of access, because there's all sorts of, you know, some you have to pay for, some you have to know the code to try and work out how to get the information out, so I think that would also be quite a benefit. I understand that um, Mr. Niedermeyer, Ludek Niedermeyer, has now arrived, or is now online, so I will pass over to him to give his opening remarks. Thank you very much and welcome, Mr. Niedermeyer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. I hope we can see each other and hear each uh, other. So first, uh, accept my apology for not being able to come in person. We have extremely busy uh, busy week uh, in, the, in the parliament and that's why I also I came late after the vote in the, in the econ. Uh, since I... I start to work on, on MLPI, and actually I, I was very interested on that issue before. Uh, I have to say that urgency of improvement is very high, as we learned, especially after we decided to react also on financial front to Russian aggression in Ukraine. We, we see that, uh, that things are not in such an order as we hoped. Sometimes it's very difficult to find out who are the, uh, the owners of some very high value assets also concerning the financial assets. And we should have in mind that when we are dealing with the sanctions as a result of Russian aggression, we are uh, dealing just with the peak of the, uh, of the iceberg. Uh, I guess in EU we are in the situation that we have one of the most advanced uh, standards uh, drafted in EU legislation, but we are short of uh, implementation and consistency of implementation. So that's why the framework doesn't work as it's supposed to be uh, working. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that the Commission has reacted, uh, responded to the calls of European Parliament that we we need some qualitative uh, improvement in our frame, uh, framework and not just uh, to do other fine tuning of the, the legislation. I guess dividing the ML package into the three main points that we are dealing with. So that means the directive regulation and creation of AMLA is very right step and the regulation itself will improve uh, the consistency of implementation and we inc uh, will increase certainty of the of the uh, private business, so that means the obliged entities. While I really uh, believe that AMLA is really badly needed uh, to make sure that uh, the system as a whole operates uh, properly. We should have in mind that in case of anti-money laundering, the goal is not just to work 90% fine, because if 10% is failing, then obviously the doors are fully open to anti-money laundering. We are currently in the in the process of uh, uh, just negotiating with uh, with reporters uh, uh, the piece I'm responsible for, so that means the directive. And I must say it's very difficult uh, uh, negotiation. While there is general consensus that we need to really move forward and come with some qualitative improvement, 
there are obviously big differences about how far to go and what is uh, feasible. Uh, we can see or we can agree that there is substantial gap in identification of physical or legal persons with the uh, beneficial ownership. The access to the data to registries is not, uh, is not uh, uh, sufficient and uh, we are struggling also with some other issues. One of them are real estates. Uh, we believe that uh, the, the real estates are very important part uh, in the in the anti-money laundering uh, framework. But at the same time, we believe that, or I believe that, we should respect the the situ how the situation technical uh, on the technical front has uh, evolved in uh, in different member states. So that's why instead of calling for uniform solution, we are calling for efficient interconnection via the electronic retrieval system uh, that will interconnect real estate uh, data uh, uh, providing the, uh, the single access point. So we believe that this is a solution that can work quickly and will fill uh, this, uh, this gap. There is a big debate about uh, the high value, uh, high value goods that are uh, uh, not covered yet or are not covered uh, properly. While uh, there is still very big discussion if uh, within the high value, uh, uh, high value goods, uh, we should focus on the goods for which there are existing data. While there is also other opinion that we should look into future and try to cover more kind, more types of high value, high value assets. My opinion, as uh, as the one of the person that was drafting the report, is that the best would be at this stage to use the registers that already exist. So that means registers of planes, uh, uh, boats, uh, uh, and uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, planes, uh, planes and uh, boats, and make sure and cars, and make sure that these registers that already exists can be used for for anti-money laundering purposes if the, the, the asset falls within the high-value asset, uh, asset ranks. Uh, other parts of the directive, and this is included into directive to reflect the different situation in the member states, is uh, enhancement of FIU uh, cooperation. We want to increase uh, interest uh, exchange of information and more importantly strengthen the, the obligation to provide the feedback to uh, oblige uh, oblige uh, uh, entities. I guess this feedback is uh, is important in order to assure that that the, the quality of work of the oblige entities is up to level that will make the the system work uh, properly. Uh, you know that uh, that we went through several cases of high uh, uh, big cases of money laundering affairs in the in the financial sector and uh, this is one of the areas where we can see also role of AMLA because AMLA should really be able to do some kind of horizontal overview of the overall efficiency of the of the framework to make sure that we quickly identify the points that are not working uh, working properly um, ending my speech at the, the AMLA you can see that in our report there were many kind of enhancement of the role. Why we are respecting the fact that AMLA is just starting, so the scope of, of responsibilities is limited, and AMLA will have to prove its uh, relevance and its importance within the framework. Nevertheless, uh, we believe that uh, that there are some areas on which we can agree. Now, for example, they can uh, help to resolve the disagreement between supervisors. They can help with, uh, with, uh, with preparing the, the, the guidelines for certain parts of the, of the, um, uh, of the elements of anti-money laundering framework. Obviously, they should, uh, they should keep the information uh, within, the, within the relevant context uh, across the uh, European anti-money anti laundering framework and so on. I believe that uh, in later stage, AMLA will, uh, will prove uh, its importance for the framework, but for the time being, we have to find uh, some, some good uh, uh, scope 
that will uh, start uh, this very important institution to, to function. So this would be uh, probably for my introduction. Uh, let me just uh, repeat that there is a general consensus that uh, we need to go uh, beyond the, the Commission proposal to reflect first uh, identified shortcomings of current frameworks and at the same time also to react the lessons that we learned uh, during the time of application of sanctions uh, 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 against uh, the Russian entity as the result of Russian aggression in the in the Ukraine. Political negotiation of compromise will be difficult. Uh, some people see that we can go much further. Some uh, would rather focus on some kind of well prepared prepared uh, progress and obviously negotiation in the uh, within the, with the council will be difficult in the trilog but the general direction is uh, is i would say uh, in the parliament uh, uh, within the line i have mentioned understanding the fact that, that the framework doesn't work properly so we need some a little bit more than just fine tuning of existing legislation thank you that's all for introduction I guess I have like uh, around like a 10 minutes, but then I need to go to other uh, other even because uh, we have extremely busy day here in Parliament. I'm sorry for that. So okay. if there are some questions, I'm happy to answer, but then I will have to go. Brilliant. Well, I think that we could certainly at least ask some. I think you mentioned when you were talking about high value goods, um, I, I, whether I caught it correctly, was cars and boats. And presumably that is one of the thought processes that have come from the sanctions with the large super yachts. Is that where that's sort of thought through and is the aim to have something similar to a real estate type um, structure where you'd actually have to register the ownership so you can identify who those are. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. Yes, the, the, uh, the idea is that in, in, I guess, in all, if not uh, most, not in all countries, uh, the, the planes uh, uh, and the larger, larger boats and basically any cars are subject to registration for different purposes. And I believe that this data uh, can be used for anti-money laundering purposes. And especially if the, the value of the assets is above certain threshold, it would be good if the register would include some, some more information that could be used for for uh, laundering, uh, laundering purposes. Uh, at the same time, as I said, uh, within the parliament, there are opinions that, that, that there should be even broader uh, scale of, uh, of the assets covered by similar system. But as long as for, for, for them, they don't exist uh, functional registered, especially uh, at least in majority of the member states, I personally have difficulties to find out how to make it efficient. While, while in these three class classes, I'm talking about cars, boats, and, and planes, the, the, some, some registers, at least for high value, uh, value uh, items uh, do exist. Okay, so it's actually looking at the ultimate beneficial owners, I think, in a bit more detail, which is quite an interesting thought. And we might pick it up uh, afterwards, yeah. If um, I may uh, continue mm -hmm. on that, the, the logic is that if we have high quality beneficial ownership uh, for, for the companies, then obviously by linking the information about who is owner of the plane and looking at the beneficial ownership information, you will get to ultimate beneficial owner. But this is still subject to negotiation. This is just the way how I look at it. So combining these two registers will lead you to, to, to the respond uh, to, to your question, who is the the, the the beneficial owner of the uh, of the uh, plane or uh, or boat without actually creating some very new complicated structures yeah no i think everybody would be grateful for that as well um just turning on to amla because obviously um i think it's recognized that that will have to start with start somewhere and it's a new organization and so i think there was a suggestion first that it may focus initially on the financial sector before moving on to um the rest of the regulated sector what are the parliament's views around that and the timing of when this might extend across the rest of obliged entities uh, my view is that the, the biggest uh, discussion is about what should be uh, exact role of the uh, of the AMLA. So that means what kind of role it should play 
in the case of uh, of this agreement between all uh, uh, supervisors or the the, the FIU. So we believe that AMLA uh, can play a mediating role. But uh, this is the part of the draft report that was not discussed with uh, with uh, uh, other shadow reporters. So I it's hard for me to uh, to assume what will be uh, the result. On one hand, there is a legitimate request to really enhance that EU the, uh, EU role in uh, anti-money laundering that would call for stronger authority of um, of uh, uh, that newly created institution. On the other hand, uh, you know that it took many years before uh, the agreement on create on on creation of this new entity was uh, was reached. So so that's why uh, some people are reluctant to, for, uh, for example, uh, give uh, the AMLA binding mediation role. But I must say that uh, that uh, I guess the biggest part of the AMLA design is going on within the AMLA uh, proposal that uh, I am not looking at. I am focusing on the, the, the responsibilities uh, given to AMLA within the, uh, the directive only. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions coming in on Sido that I should be aware of, um, Chiara? Chiara, is there any um, questions coming in from remotely? No. Thanks. Hi. So uh, our online audience can ask their questions through Slido when the panel discussion starts. Um, so you can uh, and insert your questions to the Slido link. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether we still have Mr. Niedermeyer or whether there. Oh, yes. Yes, I, yes, I am there. But as long as there are no no questions, I would probably rather leave to uh, to. Um, other event, uh, obviously, this, we are still in the middle of the process, so I guess there will be more opportunities to discuss uh, the situation in more details after we at least have uh, the EP position uh, within within the package, and then obviously when the uh, after we conclude the trial work. Right. Thank you very much for for inviting me, and thank you for acceptance. Uh, the fact that uh, I have two busy schedules, so I am not as as available as I, I hoped. Thank you, and thank you for your contribution as well. Goodbye. Um, and now what I'll do is invite the panel to sit up here so people don't have to hop up and down. It was only literally for a short term. <laughs> and I don't know where if we could get the microphones sort of for everybody. I think we've got one short. We have quite a few here. Are there three, four? Have we got five? Uh, two more on, on that table. Oh, in that case, we have one more. Okay, I think we might have one for everybody in that yeah. case. Perfect. I think everybody's got one. Yes, of course you can. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for your patience on this. So, um, all right. So we got through a couple of questions. So I'm just going to go and turn to, um, to Chris now from the FIU and just sort of say, what do you think the difference with the coordination activity um, that is proposed for AMLA will make in terms of cross-border collaboration? I think Chiara mentioned earlier that there is already considerable amount of cross-border collaboration. So what's the big difference here and how do you see the benefits of this part of the package? Well, the, is it working? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, the, the big difference um, will be that actually to, to stay in financial terms, the, the FIUs now have to put the, the money where their mouth is. Because uh, we always say, and we, we write in every report that we we cooperate and we do so, but now we have to find a way to cooperate even more efficiently. Um, if you look at the biggest challenges we face is that because of the, the evolution of the financial landscape, everything is going faster. So we need to be very fast because at the end of the day, an FIU that's not uh, helping the repressive side to, to get money back isn't the real FIU. So we need to, to, uh, to put our hands on the money. So that means um, we need a, a very good system to, to work with, with each other. That's the first point. You need technically, you need help financially also uh, to have uh, servers, to have money, to be able to work together on, on a technical side. The second one is that um, by origin, FIUs have always been uh, independent. Uh, and 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 that's a, that's a key a key question. But that doesn't mean that they their independency um, uh, lives in an ivory tower. So what we need now is actually to see that if we really want to battle uh, the money laundering on European level, we need to emphasize this European cooperation cooperation even more. 
And that even then, meaning on national side, meaning that sometimes maybe some STRs will not be treated because you, you put your priority on, on European cases, should be the case. And we should explain it on a national level. So that's, that's the second uh, big challenge, that actually through the EMLA, every FIU will understand that the biggest, maybe, the biggest role that they play is to cooperate and to fight money over the over the, the borders. Because that's what criminals do, they don't have any borders. We will have now, um, through EMLA, we hope, the opportunity to work also kind of borderless. So that, for me, is the biggest uh, pro uh, on the EMLA, and I really believe in it, so I hope that this will be uh, voted uh, as, as soon as possible. Brilliant, thank you. And I'm now going to pass on to law enforcement and say, from your perspective, I mean, typically, I think you uh, do investigate within your national borders, and how will the international collaboration affect you? Uh, that's uh, yeah, I think it's on. Yes. Uh, that's very difficult, because uh, as law enforcement and, and justice, we have to uh, abide certain uh, rules. So, but criminals, they, they put some money from in 10 minutes around the world, and that's also a challenge for us. We, we have to obey to rules, and that's our biggest challenge. So, uh, I saw that you have <coughs> problems in uh, implementing uh, uh, legislation. That's one thing, but enforcing legislation is also something that is a problem. Because uh, uh, Sylvia talked about UBO register, mm -hmm. for instance, you don't know uh, how many how many how many uh, Donald Ducks and uh, Mickey Mouse's are administrator, according to the UBO register here in Belgium. Uh, the accountants they have they are the enforcers, in fact, of the UBO register because when they have a new client or existing clients, they have to verify if the UBO register is uh, compliant or uh, consistent with what is uh, um, published in the National uh, Gazette, mm -hmm. for instance. So I think, I don't know where it, how it is in other countries, but for me, uh, legislation is good, but you have also to make it that it can be enforced because otherwise it has no sense. Yeah, and I think I think many of us who are on the um, regulatory compliance side would probably echo that, that legislation is good, but it's not just enforcing, it's being able to implement it and use it. Um, and I don't know if you've got particular comments on that kind of theme, Mika, as to you know some of the areas of challenge you might see in the new draft um, uh, regulations or directive in terms of just implementation. Are there any, or do you think they've got it right? Well, I think... Uh, mainly, um, the, we we welcome the, the package. I, I think it's 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 well thought out, and uh, and uh, let's hope that the uh, it, it, they will the, the requirements will be so clearly formulated that the the member states won't be able to mess it up with <laughs> with uh, gold plating and and and, and so on. Uh, there are some points of concern uh, from a risk based uh, approach perspective, and and there are some requirements for for obligatory enhanced due diligence, like for the politically exposed persons and also uh, third country, uh, high risk country um, transactions where you have to do the enhanced due diligence irrespective of the risk of the underlying transaction. And there, I think we would welcome a bit more flexibility. So if the, the transaction, like, well, uh, and, uh, like in my own country, uh, insurance products are are uh, fall within the scope of the 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 uh, AML uh, uh, requirements, which is a prime example of, uh, of national gold plating, I think. But uh, then, then, when when we go to low risk like travel insurance uh, products, and you have to conduct enhanced due diligence and and get a senior management approval. To, to sell a, a uh, uh, insurance product uh, with a value of, of, uh, of like less than 100 euros and uh, and like uh, the possibilities for money laundering or terrorist financing are not real at, at least for us 
quite obvious. In, in those, this is a very extreme example, but I think that, that there should be a bit more flexibility there. But I, I think that this, these, these are, are good, and, and again, we would like to underline the importance of risk-based approach and, and being able to, to, to actually uh, uh, apply these requirements on a risk-sensitive basis. I think that would be very, very important for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Savina, do you have any comments around that area, the particular areas that you think the DNFBPs might find challenging to implement? Um, and I think also a number of the comments that have been in the past, because again, we welcome this package. We think it's a really good package. So it's just making comments around the edges more than anything else. It's that where perhaps it's written more with banks and financial institutions in mind, which means that those of us who are neither banks nor financial institutions struggle a bit to try and direct that to our own compliance system. So I just wondered if you had any comments on that and where you wouldn't mind some thought. I think it's working. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. And um, that's one of the main issues that the NFBPs have had since they were included in the international standards as, as sovereign identities. Um, I think that there is no doubt that the standards, not even the European standards, are written for financial institutions. And uh, particularly in the case of the GNFBPs, uh, some of the traditional ways of including them, um, in our opinion, do not exactly match with the risk of the GNFBPs. Um, one example, and I'm, I, I'm so sorry because I have, uh, even I, I represent the GNFBPs in general, my, my, my experience is much more related to the, to the notary sector. And one of the main issues in that sense, for example, is that um, the transactions why the notaries are included as of light entities do not exactly match with the most risky transactions that notaries do, particularly uh, for the um, civil law notaries. Uh, they are thought that they are written for common law notaries, which uh, do not match exactly. And that is a problem when uh, we have to apply on, or the sector has to apply a risk-based approach because they are of light entities uh, for some of the services they provide, but not those services are the most risky ones. So in that sense, the, 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 the legislations uh, around the world and, and in Europe are quite different because some of them have included for all the transactions or the services they provide, like in the case of, Ken of Spain and some others have only included them only for the services which the directives or the FATF standards uh, say. So in that case, it is quite particularly difficult uh, for all the DNFBPs uh, to adapt uh, the, 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 the systems in place uh, to the regulation because not always it's, it's easy. Uh, he, Mika mentioned the, the, the thing of the, of the uh, PEPs, the politically exposed persons. Um, in our case, we do not have m mostly issues with that. We, we uh, recognize that it has been a, a huge e effort to include them as in the enhanced due diligence, not only by the by Europe but also by the FATF. Uh, if we remember that we started with the foreign PEPs and then including the national PEPs was a huge effort and a necessary effort. In in our opinion, that's not a major concern for us. But yes, for the small practitioners, how to implement the AML regulation could be quite difficult. That's why, in most of the cases. Um, uh, we, uh, we strongly recommend those which have a self-regulatory body, as I mentioned before, to be involved on that, on assisting the practitioners, on including them. And from the supervisory sector, to have in mind that uh, the DMFBPs is too heterogeneous. Um, there are no differences between uh, real estate, casinos, uh, or, um, or legal professionals, and even between the legal professionals. Uh, or accountants or auditors, uh, there are differences on the provision of the service and in the in the practice that they have. So I think that that has to be considered from the supervised sector when conducting the supervision. And even though the AMLA is not expected to um, supervise directly the DNFBPs on the on the first stage, and hopefully, in our opinion, not even in the second stage, <laughs> uh, but considering that when doing the, this guidance for supervisors, the differences on the practice of the DNFBPs. 
Yeah, and I think that's something certainly that the accountancy sector has called for is to make sure that those differences do get recognised, but also thinking about things like proportionate approach. I'm going to put a question to you, um, but it's probably one for more than one person, which is, you know, AMLA has got a lot of expectations riding on it. It's obviously a critical part of this package um, to both drive a consistency of supervision across the union, without which the package probably will, will struggle to have the impact that's desired. And I think also to try and coordinate um, the intelligence sharing amongst FIUs. Um, and I'm going to ask you first, Chris, do you think that actually it will be able to put in effect, it, it, will, you know, it will be able to achieve both of those goals, or will it take some time before they actually, you know, we see the benefits? Because I think there's an expectation here of, you know, so this is the new and shiny. Yeah, well, well, I, I can only speak from my experience, so it's more about FIUs. Um, um, if we see that, um, um, j just an introduction, I'm also chairing the advisory group of FI unit, which means that actually we in in, uh, in Europe, we have, a, and it's only in the world, we have a decentralized way of uh, working with each other, which actually allows to, without having central data, databases with all the uh, law uh, and, and, and legislative pr problems that you can have, that we can share much more than in the rest of the world. So keep that in mind. Uh, with, with matching possibilities that we never had before and we cannot have if we centralize it. So, um, speaking about that system, system uh, FI unit, which will be a central component of the advisory group. Well, um, we, uh, I was responsible with the advisory group to transfer the FI unit as such to the commission. So actually there we, uh, we have DJ FISMA IT who is working with it. And not only did we, we in one year and a half did we transfer the money, we also uh, transferred the FI unit. It's uh, lapses of because of my work. Uh, we, we transferred the system. Um, we also were able to stabilize it, stabilize it. So actually now we are already in the business development side to create a next generation FI unit. I never thought to be able to, to speak about three years after we started started the transfer that I'm already speaking now about new possibilities about the FI unit to cooperate. So actually there in the FI unit and in the way that we work, there already there, there is a lot of ground that's already there, but simply needs to be exploited. And I'm going to give a, a very, AMLA is based on joint analysis. FIUs now do analyze jointly, but they do it in their corner. So it's every day that I will have one of my analysts asking questions to uh, Germany and to France about the same case. That we do. What we don't do for the moment is then when we reach actually the end of the case, we simply say that we have reached it and we tell everybody. But we don't, together, we don't go together to, to, to present it in the best possible way to law enforcement authorities around Europe. So that's, that's a big achievement. And it's, it's feasible. So yes, I'm very, it's also by nature, but I'm very optimistic if I see the way that the unit uh, is, is, is going now. If I see that actually we are, um, like uh, the, the member of parliament said, we're starting from existing uh, registries, he said, we start from existing practices that we will enhance. So if we have the uh, AMLA that we, we want, I think progress will be very soon even uh, visible and touchable. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to ask you, Chiara, if you don't mind, uh, also because we've heard that pr it's likely that AMLA is going to start with the financial institutions before it moves on. There's another part within um, the supervisory element, which is the creation of statutory um, bodies to oversee self-regulatory bodies. So how do you see the combination of those working to actually improve the effectiveness of this regime? Yes, thank you. And uh, mm, indeed, uh, uh, one of the key areas where AMLA is expected to, to play a, a central role in supervision by being the direct supervisor is the financial sector. But like I was mentioning in my initial remarks, uh, uh, we were very determined not to lose sight of the non-financial sector. Um, and uh, indeed, the, the way that we went about it was to try and have some sort of coherent approach across member states. So uh, in the financial sector, you have a quite consistent uh, design of supervision across member states uh, with public authorities uh, being the supervisors. So you look at the non-financial sector, you have uh, all sorts of uh, um, constellations possible. You have uh, either a single supervisor, maybe in the unacceptable. Uh, we are in the single digits, uh, it's just not credible. Um, so that's 
one element, uh, but we also needed to find a way in terms of uh, improving uh, cross-border cooperation between supervisors in the non-financial sector, which at present is actually something that we don't see happening very much, notwithstanding the fact that you do actually have uh, quite a number of cross-border operations in the non-financial sector too, and, and professionals that do have cross-border presence. So why this uh, public oversight authority? Uh, first, uh, to make sure that uh, there is this uh, quality of supervision, uh, regardless of whether the supervision is performed by a public authority or a self-regulatory body. We are not talking of a, of a supervision that has to be substantive. Uh, Nobody is asking uh, this oversight authority to redo the work of the self-regulatory body, but it will be there to strengthen a bit what's going on now, making sure that the, st the supervision is up to the standard, that it's intense enough, for example, something that we are not seeing uh, in some cases today, and also when it covers several sectors to allow uh, a transfer of good practices from one sector to the other. And then in terms of, uh, of interaction uh, within AMLA, like I said, when you have supervisors that are law enforcement authorities, it's very difficult to imagine that in a context of uh, a public authority like AMLA, you would have uh, an ease of discussions between this law enforcement authority and a self-regulatory body. So it makes much more sense uh, to have their public authorities that are the counterparts of AMLA and that are also responsible towards AMLA for their work. So this is something that I've also mentioned already in the past to the non-financial sector and particularly to, to those sectors that are covered and have the possibility to be supervised by self-regulatory bodies. When you see the enforcement powers that AMLA has vis-a-vis -vis the sector, we're never talking about super enforcement powers towards the self-regulatory body itself. The onus uh, is on the oversight body to make sure that there is good quality supervision at the level of the member state, and they will always be the target of AMLA's enforcement actions, uh, not the self-regulatory body itself, and definitely not the individual notary lawyer or accountant. Okay, so it's sort of one of those essential stepping stones to make sure that the system works in, in collaboration effectively. Um, just conscious, so from your perspective, either in law enforcement or generally, what do you think, is there likely to be some significant impact from this regulation in terms of your work or will it just make, is it just facilitate what you're doing? Uh, of course, when we get uh, an FIU report, we can, cont once uh, the FIU reported to law enforcement, they may disclose any information they have. So in this prospect, if there's a cooperation between FIUs, we could eventually ask through the FIU to give us information which comes from abroad. It, it cannot be used in the, in the official, let us say, investigation. But once we know it, we can ask then official. So in this prospect, it, uh, cooperation between the FIUs might be very interesting for us uh, mm -hmm. as we can get unofficial information that we then confirm by official demand to the country which disposes of the, the information. Okay, so effectively what we're talking about is that the use of that intelligence allows you to get the evidence that can help you build your case. In yes, a sense. yes. Yeah, okay. But which I have to say the, the information that is provided uh, by the FIU, it, it cannot be used directly. Uh, we have to do, in fact, if the FIU has done its analysis, we have to start all over again because the information they give us for, on, for us, it's only uh, unofficial uh, information, in fact. To, uh, the information from the FIU, we can it not use it directly in our, uh, uh, fin in our investigation. Okay, so it informs it rather than directs it. Recommend? Yes, of course.
Hello there, Richard Doherty. I'm with the Proof of Trust, which is a um, small uh, IT company which has developed blockchain-based software to help financial actors verify the bona fides of clients, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So very focused on this issue. Just was triggered by the debate about um, what you just said, uh, Mr. Delrue, about um, restrictions, it sounds like, on sharing information, which you would get. I mean, one of the things we're finding is outside the union, uh, in many countries, we're getting a lot of interest um, from uh, central banks and uh, government authorities who are providing public money to actors, as well as obviously to banks um, in, the, in the commercial market. Um, and I think there's a huge... Um, growth in awareness on the need to um, address the risk of, of money laundering, terrorist financing, etc. So I'm surprised, and I don't know enough about the legislative framework, but I'd be interested to hear, um, you implied you were restricted in your ability to share that information, etc. So the broader question is also uh, to the Commission. Um, how broad are you going in terms of working with non-member states? Um, be it the UK, the Americans, uh, we're doing a lot in the Middle East, for example, um, because as you know, it's been said already, uh, money laundering certainly doesn't stop at uh, at borders, and um, you know it sounds like you're somewhat hindered in in your capacity to to go further than than that you might be able to. Thanks. So I think the question there, and I think there was some comment at the end about working with third countries, but I'll pass that over to you if I may, Kara. Yes, um, I don't want to to answer for others, but I, I think uh, we are not really talking of restrictions. So we are talking of uh, use that can be made of information. So what uh, Kert was talking about is the fact that you can't take intelligence and use it as evidence mm -hmm. unless your legal framework allows you for that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you are restricted. Uh, basically, that uh, once you get information from cross borders, if you have to have evidence, uh, then you. Uh, send a, a mutual uh, legal assistance request uh, and you get formal uh, replies that you can then use in court uh, when you decide to prosecute. So I th and I think that's yes. what we were after. We were not really looking at restrictions uh, themselves. So I think uh, uh, then again, I will have to talk uh, for someone else. <laughs> so uh, we, of course, like Chris mentioned, uh, within the union, uh, you have uh, very close cooperation between FIUs and very powerful tools, uh, indeed, uh, um, the FIU net, which uh, we hope uh, once we give to AMLA, we will be able to even further strengthen. Uh, and we did put money aside for that in the hope that it really becomes uh, the central system for FIUs. Uh, um, but uh, we do have uh, a broader context uh, for FIU cooperation worldwide. And there is quite an intense uh, exchange of information also with counterparts in third countries. So it's just that the mechanisms uh, and the systems that are used are not the same. Uh, you have the Agmon Secure Web for exchanges, uh, and the principles uh, are a bit different in the sense that it's uh, reciprocity and that you would essentially look at how the FIU operates in the other country, whether they can ensure uh, protection of the information you share. But the basic line that you would want to share information is there. Now, you quoted a few member states, uh, well, sorry, future countries. I will speak with regard to the one that by now I know best, because I was uh, lucky enough to be negotiating the TCA with the UK. And we did provide uh, for all the possible mechanisms to support uh, operational cooperation at any level, at the level of the supervisors of the FIU or of the law enforcement. Uh, so there was never intention to put uh, any barrier or restriction to that cooperation. One thing we couldn't do for sure was uh, let the UK stay as a, as a hub in the FIU net system because it's no longer a, a member state and it wasn't possible to keep them in. But if you look at the proposal, the proposal actually opens uh, the door to third countries FIUs, provided that the EU FIUs sitting in AMLA agree to that. So if that's not the case, uh, there are still mechanisms that facilitate that third country cooperation. But I don't think we are closed in any way or we are actually hindering in any way cooperation. 
I think you wanted to come in, Chris, and then yeah, yeah, maybe I can come in, uh, Angela, because because actually I think that uh, we must never forget the, the the real reason the system exists is to protect the citizen. That means that your system, as such, al also does needs to protect the citizen, and we don't we may not forget our roles. And an obliged entity that see that sees something suspicious, it's only a suspicion. It's nothing more. And if IU goes further, analyzes, and sees a serious indication, it's nothing more. It's not a proof. You need to be protected by your legislative system that you as a citizen are not going to be um, uh, tagged as a criminal before all the rules are applied. And that's why, uh, why we work. So we give all the information we need to law enforcement authorities for intelligent purposes. Um, and we, but we need to protect that. We need to make sure that if it's, it's really uh, used before. And there's a, there's a difference in Mr. There. Uh, of course, if, if we give a real uh, if an history of, of, um, of financial transactions, of course, that can be used. It's the analytical part and the link between the criminal, the, the, the criminal activity and the person that, that we talk about that needs to be proven. Uh, so that's the way you need to see it. And that's actually what Chiara says also to third countries. We simply need to make sure that because we are not working with designed uh, criminals, we are thinking that maybe there's a serious indication that they could be money launderers, that we need to protect them also and need to be sure that if I give information to a third country, that it's not misused which is also a debate about the risking that we, we can talk about that. So that's that's the real uh, the real issue here. Yeah, and, um, and it does link into the de-risking debate, um, I think, quite substantially, because um, those who make the reports are based on suspicion, but they then have to make commercial decisions whether or not to continue. I don't know whether you've got any comments on that, Mika, you sort of, because it, it is, I agree, there are, far, there are two different levels. You work on suspicion, you may have a higher or a lower level of suspicion, but it is based usually on suspicion. Yeah, well, this is a very interesting topic. We could we could spend a day a on, whole day on, on it. Yeah, on, I, on, so on that. I think we just make a few comments and move <laughs> yeah. on. Uh, well, it's I, I think that the, from from an institution's perspective, the 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 situation is is uh, is perhaps a bit different and also uh, in many cases very, even more limited. So that uh, uh, this ability to uh, exchange information between uh, other obliged entities within an industry or with the authorities, it's it's a, a topic that is being now heavily discussed. And I think that uh, that's, we, we certainly hope that uh, this question would be addressed also in, in, in well, the Well, I think you're segueing nicely onto yeah. the discussion that I think is around that, which yeah. is around the public-private partnerships. Yeah. Um, and I will say on behalf of you, Chiara, that no, we're not saying that they're new, shiny, and we should ignore everything else. They're just <laughs> one other angle to this problem to try and look at it. So I, I'll make that comment, and you may want to make it further yourself afterwards. But Mika, I think if you've got the floor for a moment on that, and I think probably others will come in there. Oh, yeah. It's it's like the there is a, actually the regarding now the public, public private budget, partnerships. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a, a, a very uh, comprehensive uh, commission working document on, on the topic, and it's very easy to to uh, to to support the, the the conclusions of this report. I, I think that the over 80% of this respondents found that the existing uh, pu public-private partnerships, information sharing partnerships, that they were very useful in, in achieving the, the, the objective. And I think that that's, and I think it's a, it's an industry perspective also that uh, this, the information sharing is, is kind of the way to, to improve the efficiency of, uh, of money laundering, it's it's not going to replace the 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 regulative uh, regulatory framework, but it's going to uh, allow the entities and and the the uh, FIUs and the competent authorities to work together to achieve better results. And I, I think that's 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 very important. And um, uh, one of the problems here is that we are having a lot of discussions. Uh, regarding the legal boundaries for for the information sharing, and and we certainly hope that uh, we we would be able to to find a solution, or um, at the European level to make that possible. Because especially in in our industry, where the uh, where the banks and other financial institutions they they typically operate in several countries within the EU, it's very difficult for them to to uh, sort of arrange their operations if they have to uh, sort of uh, comply with with multiple uh, 
set of regulations, even though they operate within the EU, they, there may be different practices in, in different countries, and, uh, and uh, very often when it comes to, to uh, private customers, uh, uh, consumers, then, then we are against the, the data protection framework and, uh, and have to find ways of, of sol solving these, these issues. But I think that the the the, uh, the information sharing is is very important, and uh, and let's hope that we'll find uh, find a way of, of moving forward and and making this this possible. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I think one comment I would make is that all sectors or all sectors of the obliged entities, and indeed some that are not within the regulated framework, often have information or intelligence that is of use. However, I think there are two kinds of information often in public-private partnerships. One is operational type information, which is of its nature very sensitive and usually highly confidential. And then there is the sort of the, the more the typologies, the red flags and the, 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 el the elements like that. And I think, Chris, maybe I could get you to comment on how how all sectors could both participate and benefit, I think, from the output of public-private partnerships in a way that protects the citizen, as you say, but also enables us to bring the fight a little bit better to the launderers. Absolutely right, Angela, because actually if, if I look at uh, PPPs, I start with PP plus PP. It may be sound, uh, but there's a public partnership and there's a private partnership, which is equally as, as important. And, and actually the, what you can share, the moment that you go from, from two Ps to three Ps, it becomes a bit more difficult. Because um, of course, and, and, I, and I fully agree that as an FIU, we should uh, have more effort uh, on giving typological um, um, uh, information, uh, red flags, indicators to the obliged entities. I don't think that anything is, is, is saying that we can't. Um, actually, having the, um, the public uh, partnerships uh, providing for information to the private there, absolutely important. But then you go a step further. And, and, and if you speak now about operational, I think that in a private partnership, in, in Belgium, for example, we can share a fair bit of, of information, if, if only by requesting information, for example, from a bank, with the private entities. But then you start sharing it, and you want to share it between public, private authorities. That's a whole other animal. Because um, you need to understand that even FIU um, disposes of information, Actually, we as FIUs, we dispose of a lot of information, but it's never actually ours, you know? Because we, we have information from law enforcement, we have information from other FIUs, we have information from banking authorities. So it, it's very difficult there to find a concept where you can share all this operational information that actually isn't yours. So please, be, please make a difference and start from, from where we need to. We need to work more between FIU speaking from mine sector and the obliged entities to give them red flags indicators to say how we work, absolutely right there. But if we go to the operational side, please be careful, um, be in mind with the GDPR and everything you want, but, but do it in a very close context and, and know why you're doing it for. So that would be my message. Yeah, and then that may be a much lim more limited group, actually. And I think so other countries, particularly somewhere like the Netherlands, have tried that. Sylvina, do you want to make some comments? Yes. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I agree with, uh, with the comments made by, by Mika and, and also uh, made by Chris um, and by Chiara, but uh, I think that is, there is lots of room for improvement in the information sharing. Um, I, I agree with him that um, there is some information and with you that there is some information, especially regarding operational information, which has to be um, shared with lots of care and with lots of boundaries because uh, there is uh, personal information, there is confidential information, and we have rules on data protection that we have to to uh, to respect. But there is lots of improvement between uh, that kind of information, operational information, and the information which is already provided by the FIUs and the public authorities. Uh, you spoke about typologies and red flags. Um, I very welcome what uh, was mentioned about the directive or about giving feedback to the obliged entities. Uh, sometimes uh, the obliged entities, particularly uh, the DNFBPs, feel that information is shared only in one direction. We send information all the time, uh, 
uh, better or worse, uh, depending on the on the system and depending on the country, because the level of compliance is not the same. And I agree with Chiara that being on one digit is not credible for anyone, and that has to be uh, improved. But uh, information is going only in one direction. There is no feedback from the FAUs and from the authorities on what is the level of compliance if it is doing if it is being doing well, and uh, even for guidances, uh, even for if if uh, the authorities wants to th the sector to improve, it also needs to be assisted on what they are doing wrong. Uh, so I think that um, these uh, PPPs, including the third P, um, as Chris said, uh, is going to be fundamental for that. And I think that everyone, even the, the, the authorities, but also the oblate entities, are fully aware of the um, care they need to, to uh, have with the information they, they may receive and uh, in which cases it, may, it might be shared and in which cases it may not. Um, especially regarding the, the feedback, no one is going to share feedback on, on suspicious transaction reports they have submitted, for example. Yeah. No, understood. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was just going to let you. Uh, I have a small remark. During my trainings, I say to the people, the reporting entities who are following the training, what comes in the FIU stays in the FIU. What I mean? because a lot of reporting entities are afraid to report because they say, my name will, and then I tell them, when you make a report to the FIU, your name falls down. We as police officers, uh, law enforcement, justice will never know who has filed the report. Of course, they say, uh, my client could uh, think it was me, but if it's a financial transaction, it could be also uh, an insurance company or a bank or an accountant who has made. So I tell them what goes in the FIU stays in the FIU. What I mean is that it doesn't come out. And that must be reassuring for reporting entities. Yeah, I think I think that is one area of where people want re reassurance. But there are different ways. I think, Nico, you were going to. Yeah. I uh, yeah, I, I think that the uh, what what Sylvina mentioned about the feedback that's that's uh, that's a very important part of the process, and it's it's not only about the PPPs, but it's also <coughs> I think uh, it's 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 very important for the oblige entities to be able to improve their operations. So, and um, wider, I think that uh, in in the package something that we hope that there are, uh, I don't know if it's too late already, but. Uh, uh, I, I think it would be very important to have a set of EU-wide statistics on on how, if we, are, I mean, if we are having a common framework, which there should be, which should be implemented in a uniform manner. I think then that we should have also a, a, a set of statistics supporting the evaluation of how we are doing, and it's it's not only about SARS, the number of SARS, by the way, uh, because of uh, of, uh, of a uh, crap, crip, uh, couple of crypto asset service provider joining in, um, providing their SDRs. Um, uh, I think last year in, in Finland we got 3.2 million SDRs, which is, uh, you know, kind of a. Uh, <laughs> you, I, I think that any FIU would be very happy to to have that workload. But that number of FIUs would be very. Uh, no, SDRs would be important, but also the number of prosecutions and and so seeing and 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 how much assets are being confiscated and and and, and so, because that would give an idea that because we are spending the financial industry is spending tremendous amount of money. I think it, the the latest figure is two hundred billion dollars on a global basis for AML and anti-financial crime to see what is actually being achieved with that, that money. So that's yeah, and, I, and I think that's one that people will echo in the regulated sector is actually understanding the impact that this is making. I mean, I, I'm based in the UK for most of the time, so I know that certainly as part of the economic crime plan, 2.0 I think we're on, um, they are looking at how to feed back actually the impact of the measures that are coming up because it, it's only then that we can actually see, do we need to tweak it? Do we need to change it? Where does AMLA need to put its emphasis and where do the other parts of this need to put their emphasis? And I agree with you, it's not the numbers of SDRs, it's possibly the numbers that can generate a useful investigation, assuming resources. And I think that's the other area that's always not mentioned is resources both at FIU and law enforcement level, because 
picking up so actually uh, how many assets get frozen how much more gets frozen if we have those kind of resources along with all of the regulatory things so it should be seen as an entire package i would say in that respect um yeah I, you can disagree with me chris if you think <laughs> No, I'm actually I'm actually agreeing um, with 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 a, with a sort of nuance that a foreign obliged entity um, the fact of doing an STR is 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 as such an um, it's a point of of what you need to do. So actually making an, an STR is already that you have done something that needed to be done. So we need to give feedback, but no, don't forget that fact of doing it you have already succeeded. That that's an important part. Um, on the um, statistic level, I can only say that uh, we have now a, a new FIU's platform. Uh, which actually pre it's it's it's, it's before AMLA it's not institutionalized but there's a working group now on statistics uh, to actually give um, real statistics if you want because we struggle uh, with with the numbers uh, we have we had and and uh, I'm very grateful to DJ Fisma for that we had in FIU because that's my of FT my FI unit uh, FI unit level we, we we ranged from high to low because there were countries that were sending a lot but but then you need to go beyond why are they sending a lot and is it does it does it mean so now we are actually having alphabetical uh, uh, the countries are, are ordered alphabetically because that's already a very big improvement that FISMA has given us to say okay we need to go beyond the and there's a working group there to actually um, give numbers that mean something then that we can use uh, with, with yeah yeah and I think the point that I mean I think we don't want to lose the point that I think you made earlier here about certain sectors where actually the numbers are so low that they can't actually be implementing the system properly so there's those that perhaps are sending in everything because actually the filters are set at a level that perhaps is incorrect which is just as difficult in many ways as those who aren't sending anything in because they just either don't recognize it so actually when we're talking about PPPs I think one of the biggest things I think might be of benefit is giving people the tools in order when something that seems obvious to one person is clearly you know not right and probably reportable becomes equally clear to others um, because I think in many cases in very small businesses it's just not something that crosses their mind so actually making it clearer might help so as part of you know, you know and I think actually some of the things you've meant you've, we've got in the package by the guidance from AMLA maybe the creation of the statutory oversight bodies working with the self-regulatory bodies may create that kind of virtuous circle but I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that Kiara. Um, I have a few thoughts on this, uh, but maybe first to reassure everybody, there are requirements on statistics, uh, and there is also um, an idea that we will have a, a harmonized uh, uh, methodology for the collection of statistics, which hopefully indeed will give us meaningful information and not just uh, how many uh, reports and how many prosecutions with no link whatsoever between one and the other. Um, bearing in mind uh, that uh, there are very many factors that actually influence uh, how a case progresses uh, from an STR level to the final conviction, and that might have nothing to do with the effectiveness of the AML system, uh, but might be impacted by other uh, factors. Um, on the PPPs uh, and, uh, and how to work together. So um, there is a reason why we have decided not to regulate DAS uh, in, the, in the package. First and foremost, because it's, uh, in a way, it's a call it a new trend. And I would say it's a trend uh, that makes sense uh, where it does make sense. Uh, there are EU member states uh, where we have uh, very effective uh, prosecution conviction systems and even asset recovery systems uh, where you don't see any PPP. There are other countries uh, that have based the effectiveness uh, of their systems on the setting up of PPPs. Uh, I'm nobody to judge which one uh, is the best, uh, and I don't think there is a final judgment uh, on which one is the best. Uh, it's really down uh, to how you want uh, to build uh, the coordination and cooperation within your framework. Um, I don't think there are limitations uh, in the ML framework in terms of how this can work, um, but there are issues. So if you decide, uh, so not discussing the the typology ones, which I think they are very safe, uh, 
Um, they can also be quite uh, all-encompassing. Um, so that's not problematic. But if you think that in the operational ones, uh, you're going to achieve the level of granularity in understanding uh, across the sector, unfortunately, you will not be able to get there. There it's a bit, uh, like Chris was saying, you have to be in a very close circle, uh, not only because the information is sensitive uh, uh, itself, because you're dealing with, pro with personal data, but because there are other, to me, even more important uh, elements that you have to take into account than, than, uh, than GDPR. And I'm talking of protecting the investigation <coughs> itself, uh, protecting the safety of the people who participate. I think we should never forget, if I think of a, of a real operational PPP, I mean, uh, I hear a lot about fraud, but to be honest, uh, to me, the most important crime still remains OCG, so the organized crime groups. Uh, and I really, really, as a private sector operator, um, will not want to see my personal safety jeopardized because I've participated and I've assisted uh, people who have made a life choice uh, to fight those criminals uh, uh, with information. So there is a lot of care that has to be taken there. And uh, I don't think that you can really expand to the level that that type of understanding can go across the entire sector. Um, also on uh, private to private information sharing, uh, uh, we did discuss the risking. Uh, I think I, I, I would add one element to that, which is uh, beware what you wish for sometimes. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I said where we started from with this package. Uh, uh, and I have to say that the quality of customer due diligence uh, and STR reporting uh, by quite a few uh, obliged entities uh, wasn't great. Uh, I'm not sure whether it has uh, massively improved since uh, it's one of the goals. And I'm sure that we're all in this together to make sure that that's where we get. But the moment that you start sharing information, which is based on, uh, on a weak mm -hmm. system of internal controls, on a wanting customer due diligence process, uh, then there are implications uh, in terms of uh, what the others uh, will do with it. And you can put all the safeguards of this world. You can say you may not use this information to the risk a client, uh, but you never know mm -hmm. what is going to happen. So there are questions that have to be asked. Uh, and also real realization that if this is the path that someone wants to go down, uh, which is, uh, a possible path, uh, then this raises the bar in terms of the expectation of quality of the checks that are done ex ante, because uh, ultimately we cannot have uh, a framework that is there to protect the functioning of the internal market that then starts creating frictions within the internal market uh, because uh, businesses cannot get access to services, individuals cannot get access to services. So it's really something that will put even more burden. It's not something that will relieve anybody of any burden. Yeah, and I think that's understood. I think, Mika, you wanted to come in, and then we need to move to the questions from the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I agree uh, with uh, what, what Kiara said. And uh, what, what I first still would like to see is that uh, instead of having this discussion that can we have information sharing, can we have these partnerships, or can we not have them? We should move on to, to having a discussion under which conditions, with which safeguards we can have this, uh, if seen appropriate for, for each country, because I understand that there will be no, no European-wide uh, uh, solution or demand or, or whatever to, to establish these for, for each member state, and I, I think this is perfectly fine. Um, and it's it's uh, also it would be very important to, to define uh, in more detail what do we actually mean by information sharing, because uh, I think w how I see it uh, the the benefits of information sharing, at least from AML and and terrorist financing and also also from financial crime perspective, they do not actually involve sharing a massive. Uh, amounts of data. 
for example, if all parties involved in information sharing already have an obligation to identify the, the beneficial owners or verify a PEP status or uh, identify who are the uh, who are the, the, the directors or, or, or uh, those uh, making decisions for a company, then I don't think there is much need for sharing that, that sort of information. So, so and, and I, I think that this is some, that's, this is one of the first things that if, if we now decide to move forward to, uh, to kind of define what do we mean when we talk about information sharing and, and then I think we can we can continue thank you thank you and i think just to um reiterate the point that obviously information sharing and public private partnerships have to work in a context of regulation supervision and enforcement so it's um just reminding people it's not um a panacea to all ills and i think that i don't think that that was what you're saying and i absolutely agree with actually the conditions within what it is and um, some of the limitations. At this point, I'm going to open up to questions from the floor. Andrea. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Andrea Bignami. I talk uh, on behalf of CNDCEC, that uh, is the Italian member body. We, I represent uh, 120,000 practitioners. I want to ask uh, this question, and, and I have a request. Uh, I think that the key matter of the PIC is the balance between provisions to put in the regulation and provisions to put in the directive. And uh, I don't know if the, 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 rest, the recent uh, events, the sanctions, the, 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 the war, have changed the view of the Commission and of the Parliament. So. Uh, if I heard, if I hear uh, well, you say, Mrs. Bacci, uh, probably the the pack will be ready for the September of 2023. So, uh, in in our opinion, there are things that must kept in the re in the regulation. First of all, the principle of a prof of proportionality because it's the key. And um, please let let us know if there are matters that can move uh, the, in your opinion. And our request, uh, as uh, accountants, we need training. I saw that there, there are training for lawyers, trained from, from, from the head, from, 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 the, from the European legislation. So when the PEC will be ready, please uh, let us do something. And Angela, please uh, be the, the means of, of transmitting this to, to Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, yes, no, I'm happy to reply to this. Uh, um, I can just uh, share what is uh, also public knowledge uh, on the basis of, for example, draft uh, reports uh, and amendments uh, by the Parliament uh, to the balance we had struck between the regulation and the directive, and there have been no movements. Uh, uh, I have to say, yes, we did struggle a bit uh, with what to put and whether we could be more ambitious uh, and harmonize more. In the regulation, uh, one of the key areas uh, we've discussed this morning was uh, beneficial ownership, transparency. Um, but uh, to be honest, uh, <coughs> it wouldn't really have had added value to have also the registers, for example, in the regulation. And it would have uh, been probably too rigid uh, with regard to what... Uh, we could have achieved. The, the way that we went uh, about uh, um, was rather to make sure that even the directive uh, has a much stronger language. It's no longer, frankly, a minimum harmonization directive, uh, so that regardless of where you are with the provisions, uh, you do ensure that level of convergence that you want to achieve, not as strict or rigid as you could have achieved with a regulation. So I'm thinking, for example, uh, because we've been speaking a lot of FIUs today, uh, one of the key elements for us was to make sure that they have access uh, to a set of information that will enable them uh, to do in a consistent and meaningful way this joint analysis. I can't create a framework for joint analysis if then I have uh, 
um, FIUs that don't have access to law enforcement information. What is what is this? Uh, I'm I'm basically giving a, a box, uh, but then I don't give the tools uh, to play with that box. Um, and the same for beneficial ownership uh, registers. We discussed about the quality of that information. If you see, yes, we left to the member states the setup of the registers, but we imposed uh, or we propose to impose because we don't decide in the end. Uh, that the authority that is in charge of the register can ask for additional information, uh, can carry out on-site checks uh, at the premises of the companies to verify the beneficial ownership information. So you can be much stronger even uh, in, a, in a context of a directive. You don't need to move everything to a regulation to achieve that. And with regard to training, uh, Yes, uh, if you read the, the text of the AMLA regulation, uh, there is a lot of material there. In terms of uh, training, uh, those who then will also become the trainers. So, um, of course, AMLA will be the direct supervisor of some entities. Uh, most likely, those entities will also include crypto asset service providers based on the general approach uh, of the Council and the mood in the Parliament for the non-financial sector. No. <laughs> for the moment, um, uh, but it was one of the key uh, tasks that we gave from the beginning to AMLA to give trainings to the FIU, to give trainings to the supervisors, to train the directly supervised entities. Now AMLA cannot reach the entirety of the obliged entities in the union. We are talking of <laughs> way too many entities, but you have, you have guidance produced for each sector on very many aspects. Uh, you have uh, uh, the information that will come with stronger guidance also from the FIUs in AMLA on the red flags, uh, on how to report, how to come uh, to the identification of what is an atypical uh, transaction and how you develop a suspicion from there on. So honestly, there, is, there, is, there will be much more to accompany the information there um, and, and how the obliged entities have to go about their job. Uh, will we have uh, instruments uh, to replicate uh, what we have done for the legal profession in terms of trainings? Well, hopefully, yes. I mean, this, but this is more something that the Commission does on an ad hoc basis, uh, and it's not necessarily a critical element uh, of the package itself. But. Uh, I mean, it's clear that whenever we can, uh, and we know that there is a demand uh, for training, we try to meet that demand as much as possible. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the floor here, or shall we, if not, I'll go to Harry to go and read them from the online agency uh, uh, attendees. No. So we have some uh, interesting questions from our online audience. Uh, so Maria Antonio from AFN is asking, is saying collaboration is a must. We need interactive and uh, we need interactive ad hoc communication for AML compliance officers and official authorities. Any thoughts for ad hoc hotline for them? And she says also, Ad hoc, uh, ad hoc uh, hotline does not need to provide confidential information. It might require just an acknowledgement whether concerns identified might be true or false. Okay, so if I can kind of uh, interpret that slightly, because I just to make sure. So we're looking for some means of getting one off either confirmation or otherwise that somebody may, for example, be correct in having suspicion or, you know, that the information they have may be of interest. I mean, that's quite an interesting one to you know, sort of raise. Um, I'm not. I'm, I'm not entirely sure who would actually be at the other end of the hotline, but you know, maybe Chris or Hert. <laughs> what would uh, you think? Well, well, actually, in an, an, in Belgian practice, if if even an obliged entity sends a, a suspicious transaction report to us, uh, and we are interested, uh, and we we will go back to the obliged entities and ask for more information. Um, that, as such, is is a way of of saying that we are interested in the information. Um, if there's information missing, we will go back to them and and say what's missing. And we can also go to the supervisor authority to say that something's missing. That's the other way around. But but there's ways. Um, if if you have um, like really really thought about uh, STRs, normally our FIU will come back to you and, 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 and we will interact. Okay, I mean, the other possibility of an answer, and I'm going to come to you in a moment, Mika, is that, that some of the professional for designated non 
financial institution, businesses and professions. Some of the professional bodies do actually have some form of um, inquiry line or technical line that people can um, contact if they've got concerns. So that may be another place. Mika, you may have some thoughts. Here. Uh, yeah, I can obviously only speak for my own country, but uh, there I, I, we, I, we don't have any, any formal uh, hotline at the, at the FIU, but uh, quite commonly I think the, the institutions call and, uh, and have discussions with the, with the FIU and vice versa. If, if uh, FIU has questions to ask or, or information to provide to a, to a single, single institution, they, they may, may use, use the phone. Uh, then there is also, um, I, I think that when looking at the solutions, there is no need to, to reinvent the wheel because we could look into the information security sector where we, there is a long tradition of information sharing between the parties. And, and I know that in, in, in some countries, for example, uh, these, obviously we're talking about different mm -hmm. types of phenomena, but for example, in, in if, if we are having a massive fraud, scandal or, or whatever that might be useful they they have just regular telephone conferences mm. so that these the, the people log in and uh, and uh, and they they exchange information there on observations and so and and everyone benefits but obviously this is again a, something that re requires a lot of <laughs> or at least a bit more uh, thinking of before before implementing but but there are ready models also available yeah i mean and that might be that if there are particular new types of fraudulent um, sort of emails or smishing or whatever, then yes, I can understand that. Are there any other questions? Uh, anyone? Oh, there's one over there, the front floor. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Angeline Camus. I work for Rydance Public Affairs. Uh, I have a remark and two questions that are linked also with what was previously mentioned. So uh, as everyone reminded in the room, I think uh, everyone understood the, the importance of harmonization, risk-based approach and clear uh, provisions. Uh, but currently there are still some uncertainties uh, also regarding oblige entities that will fall inside the scope. And it's also linked to the point that was previously made and the interactions of provisions between the directive and the regulation. So I wanted to, to ask uh, the Commission if uh, they are aware of uh, this type of issue that uh, still remains and if it's uh, taken into account inside the negotiations uh, currently. Um, and I wanted to also ask if you would potentially consider uh, useful to uh, include inside uh, the provision, the core text of the provision, uh, clarification on some obliged entities. Uh, thank you. Um, no, I'm not aware that the scope of obliged entities wasn't clear. Um, it's uh, if the point is that uh, by design uh, we decided to leave it open to member states to expand beyond. Well, that's a it's a thought through choice, uh, and we did it uh, precisely to to satisfy the risk based approach because there are situations in some member states uh, where you may need to go beyond. Uh, the set of obliged entities that have been identified at European level based on the specific risks uh, at national level. So that to us is something that has a merit in being there and it's not, uh, it's not an oversight. We didn't do it uh, because we didn't quite know how to handle some sectors. Uh, but if there are specific sectors that you do have in mind, I mean, I'm happy to discuss that. Uh, but I, we haven't received any feedback even in, in discussions uh, that the scope itself wasn't clear. Um, you may see, for example, that there may be an interest to go beyond what we have put, or for example, uh, looking at the draft report by the parliament, you will see that our proposal for crowdfunding was to cover only the non-regulated ones, uh, whereas the approach taken by parliament is uh, all crowdfunding platforms. Uh, that's clearly clearer in terms of scope. Uh, but it's not because uh, it wasn't clear what we had designed in the first place. Okay, have you got any other questions? Have you got one? Uh, so someone from our, our audience is saying on the uh, protection of uh, private information, suspicious transaction reporting. 
So uh, she or he says, unfortunately, this has not been the case in Italy since we had leakage of information on suspicious transactions. And um, therefore, this is still a significant issue that discourages reporting. Okay, so this is somewhere where they're saying that the information going to the FIU doesn't necessarily remain there. And, I mean, I'm aware that in other countries the law is slightly different than perhaps it is in Belgium. So there can be circumstances where, for whatever reason, it may have to be disclosed in certain cases. And it may also be that, in some cases, banks, in order to protect themselves against civil claims for not processing transactions, may also wish to disclose in some cases. So there are some circumstances, although I'm not familiar with the leak in Italy. Oh, you are. Okay, yeah, I'll let you pass over. Yes, I know the case. Uh, um, and it's, it was actually a very unfortunate one. Uh, it's because the name of the report in person uh, and that was in the, in the files of the, of the case before the court, and there was a, a leak at the moment uh, of, uh, of the judicial procedure. Um, actually, from, uh, from what I understood, there has been a modification to the rules in Italy to make sure that the name uh, of the reporting person is no longer included um, or, or cannot go from the FIU to, uh, to the law enforcement uh, steps. So that should have been addressed. Uh, it's something that we had actually discussed because it was the case of a notary. Uh, in Italy where this has happened. Uh, um, so it's, it's clearly problematic, uh, clearly uh, a very sensitive issue. Um, but uh, as far as I know, actually, the situation has been solved. Thank you. Did you want to come in, Miha? Uh, yeah, I, I think this, uh, this goes back to, uh, at least in Finland, goes back to the national legislation, and it's, it's sort of uh, also goes to the to the, uh, the the right back, uh, the right of the the defendant or in in a crim criminal case that uh, uh, we have had this discussion that uh, is the, this person defendant uh, um, uh, entitled to get the information who filed the report and there uh, the the uh, it, it's I, I think that the current interpretation is that uh, this this uh, he is entitled to get the information and it may leak forward and and we have criticized this because uh, this in in many cases it 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 jeopardizes the um, the the person who is who has filed the report yeah i'm i'm familiar it's i know it's no longer in the eu but i'm familiar with a similar case in the uk where that's happened and i think it comes back to a point that Hert made earlier about the difference between intelligence and evidence. So actually the argument should be that in most cases, the actual um, STRS AR should be just intelligence and then it should be, evidence should be sought. And at that point, that evidence can be disclosed rather than the reporter or the reporter. And I mean, it is as somebody who, you know, no longer does because I'm no longer the money laundering reporting officer, but for many years was actually the one who was named. I have quite a strong interest <laughs> in this because <laughs> typically there's four to five years lag often before, or there can be up to four to five years lag before something happens. Um, are there any other questions? Because I think we've got time for one quick question, if there's any more. Yes, there is something. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So uh, someone from our audience says that there is also a need to get feedback about the quality of the suspicious transaction report. This helps to increase quality. And I think, uh, if I remember correctly, this is something that Silvina has already raised. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's one that, you know, we don't have a supervisor here, which would be quite useful, I think. But, uh, Sylvia, I don't know whether you want to make further comments on that. Well, I, I don't want to skip the, the question, but uh, we don't have a supervisor, but we have a, an FIU member, mm -hmm. which is the one that um, receives the STRs and should be given the, the, the feedback. Um, I agree with, but I have already said that before, and I think that we all agree that the feedback on the quality of STRs may improve the the quality for the sector and is essential for the improvement of the of the system. I think that there is no doubt about that. There is <clears throat> only the 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 responsibility of the uh, of the system to start to implement that as a, as an obligation or as a best or good practice at least. Just to add to 
just to add to that, in, in Belgium we have an, uh, a continuous cooperation between FIU and supervising authority where we give quantitative and qualitative feedback to the supervisor. Again, uh, then it's up to them to do something with it or not. That's not in FIU's uh, perspective, but we do have a system of in, in giving them this kind of uh, information. Yeah, and I think that's the point is that we, you know, the FIU can give information about the quality of what it's receiving but and actually to make a change you almost need the supervisor to look at a particular firm and what it's producing and say actually it doesn't meet the scratch or you, you know how come you've had no SARS in the last five years or whatever it is you're you know so I think there is yet another kind of leg to that argument if I, may, I, I think that that depends on the on the system there are many systems where the FIU and the supervisor uh, or the FIU has supervisory functions. Yes. So in that case, the sharing of the, of the information is quite easier. In, in, in the case of, of Spain, for example, every time the supervisor intends to supervise an entity, one of the things that request from the analysis perspective is the quality of the SDRs they have submitted. So in, in those systems, it works a little easier uh, than if the supervisor does not or is not part of the, of the FIU. But I think that there are still place for improvement of that. Some systems uh, works on the on the same sense. But not only the feedback for the for the supervisor is, is essential uh, when conducting or when preparing the super the supervision, but also for the oblight entity mm -hmm. in order to know how they are doing things and what can be improved. I think that is a good a, a good uh, practice uh, for the entire system, not only for the oblight entity, but also for the FIU, which will receive better and more quality SDRs from that entity. Yeah, I mean, I would probably just put one minor modification to that, which is there are different types. Because it, you have to look very carefully at national laws around what needs to be reported, because in some cases the national laws require reports in cases where relatively modest amounts of information are available to the reporter, but they're still obliged to do it. So there's a bit of a double-edged sword here around, you know, we're getting lots and lots of reports of low quality. Well, you might be, but actually that's because the law requires somebody to make that report. Um, but that's not to denigrate from the cases where actually people could have put more effort in, and there's a very fine balance to be put around that. I sort of just would just make that point because there are some cases where that will also be the case, you know, where it's actually you have to report it and you don't have much information. Right, well, I think we will, with this, we will sum up. So I will thank everybody for their um, attendance here and for their patience and their questions. Thank all of the panel for, for what I think has been a really, really interesting discussion, um, bringing out some of the points around the package, which we will just re-emphasize we are all very supportive of, although I think sitting in your seat sometimes, Kiara, it may sound like we're not. <laughs> but it's actually there is a real desire to make this work and to get the um, standardization and the harmonization across Europe to make this more effective. Um, because I think a point that was made by Chris earlier, and I think it also, is that this is to protect citizens in all of its shapes, forms, and descriptions. Well, we know that for the next few years, what most of us on this panel will be doing, and I suspect many of you in the audience will also have, um, you know, sort of um, responsibilities in that area or an interest in that area. What I can probably say with confidence, having been specialising in f economic crime for about 15 years, is I doubt this will be the last that we hear. Um, you know, it's a process of constant evolution as criminals become smarter and more international. So with those remarks, which sounds a bit cheery, but we're all very, I mean, we are all quite determined to try and do what we can, um, is you know, to say thank you very much, to say thank you to those in Accountants Europe who've put this on, including all of those in the technical team at the back here. Nobody's been cut off. We've managed to get everybody um, you know, showing up when they, do, they did. So thank you all very much, and I hope you have a very good rest of the day. Thank you to the...